genealogy of morals. Nietzsche has been explaining the persistence of asceticism, which we usually associate with religion. An ascetic submits herself to severe disciplines, fasting, sleeping on a bed of nails, in order to bring her body and spirit in line with the truth. Think monks, nuns, teenagers at God camp, your whole life in pursuit of one thing, that's asceticism. Now we modern enlightened people tend to think about ascetics as a little bit deranged. You know that scene in Monty Python's Holy Grail with the monks walking in circles? <laughs> Universes bubbling out from the infinite sea of energy. 
Others can figure it temporally, with universes collapsing and then forming again. In some models, every quantum possibility plays itself out in a different universe. Think here of that episode of Community, where Jeff rolls the dice and produces six different endings, right? And finally, there's the cosmic landscape, which posits up to 10 to the 1,000 possible universes. Some might have more gravity than ours does, others might have eight spatial dimensions, others might be nothing more than an empty triangle, and according to the mathematician Max Tegmark, Tegmark, each of these 10 to the 1,000 universes actually exists. Moreover, he says, an infinite number of each of them actually exists somewhere out there beyond space and time. Now, on the one hand, this vision might seem the ultimate triumph of science over religion. The multiverse gives us an objective view not only of this universe, but of all possible universes. Who needs an all-seeing God if we've got all-seeing scientists? Moreover, the multiverse obliterates the old argument that this universe has been fine-tuned for us by an intelligent God. If every possible universe exists somewhere, then ours is nothing special. Finally, the multiverse gives cosmology all of those other specimens that it needed to study this specimen scientifically. It seems, then, to be the ultimate scientific vision of reality, a godless, objective view of everything from nowhere. Not so fast, says cosmologist George Ellis, perhaps the most vocal critic of multiversal extravagance. Ellis balks at the proclamation of an infinite number of universes totally disconnected from ours. If such universes are inaccessible, he says, then by definition they're beyond the bounds of science. The multiverse postulates worlds that can't be tested or proven, and as such, Ellis says, it is, quote, implicitly redefining what is meant by science, unquote. So from this perspective, the infinite worlds of the multiverse are not the consummation of science, but its betrayal, a total violation of the principles of falsifiability, testability, and economy that undergird the scientific project. But here again, I find myself tuning back into Nietzsche. Do you really want to know what conquered Christianity, Nietzsche asks? And the answer, he says, is not science, but Christianity itself. Christianity told us to go out and seek the truth, the objective truth, and when we found it, we realized the idea of God was not true. Science, he says, is therefore the self-overcoming of Christianity. What he means is that Christianity produces modern science in a staggering gesture of self-sabotage. In this manner, Nietzsche says, all great things bring about their own destruction. Which has me wondering, if science is the self-overcoming of Christianity, could multiverse cosmologies be something like the self-overcoming of science? The consummation and the collapse of the scientific effort to overcome religion. Because let's face it, an infinite number of all possible worlds looks a lot more like some new mythology than it looks like science. All great things bring about their own destruction, and I think I can hear the news pulsing through the infinite worlds of the multiverse. Thanks.